Well, most people, I think, unfortunately, when they do administrative law, what they do it, they do it as a, a branch of public law, independent of the private law foundations on which the particular subject in question rests. And that's always a huge mistake. Um, what you have to do is to figure out what the subject matter is before you could figure out how it's going to work with administration. And I'll give an explanation as to why that's important in a moment. Uh, so uh, what happens is uh, you've got this notion that it's all uneasy. And then the next word that I start to use is the word modern. Uh, and that word is put there with a very discreet purpose, which is administrative law, roughly speaking, in the United States uh, falls within two periods. And there'll be parallels in other kinds of countries where you've had similar forms of uh, regulation and so forth. Uh, the American Constitution gets going in around 1787 and about 150 years to the day in the 1936-1937 period, what we do is we have a major transformation of the scope of federal powers underneath our constitutional order. Uh, this is a progressive move, uh, more generally a New Deal move inside the United States. And essentially what it does is it removes two kinds of shackles that previously had limited the way in which the government could operate and therefore the way in which administrative law could operate. Uh, the first of these particular uh, limitations was that on federalism. And so all of a sudden, modern administrative law becomes something in which there's virtually no topic that you cannot subject to regulation of one kind or another. And the second of the major variations is a weakening of the notion of property rights uh, from a relatively strong conception of something which gives you the right to exclude to a much weaker conception, uh, which announces that what is going to happen is that people do have rights, but the rights are not those of exclusion. They are the rights to participate in some kind of political process, which can help to organize the way in which the uh, law is to be shaped. Uh, so uh, you might want to say that the uh, traditional system is relatively univocal, and the other system is much more polycentric. Uh, these look to be, for the most part, substantive changes changes, but it turns out that they have very powerful constraints on the uh, way in which administrative law is going to start to operate. Uh, so in the book, what I do is I begin, first of all, with the sort of classical liberal conception. This goes back, Mark, to Roman law kinds of notions and also to medieval notions and, modern, and early modern American notions as to what it is that the state is or is supposed to do. And if you start looking at, at those kinds of situations, uh, what you do is you see that the classical categories, both Roman and civil law on the one side and common law on the other side, start with a series of relatively simple and powerful propositions about the way the world is organized. I'm not going to spend time here talking about one important element of this, which is how it is that you organize the commons. Uh, that is, for example, water and air kinds of resources. I'm going to stress for the moment here just the private property side of this situation. And it's quite clear if you start to do this, what you discover quite simply is uh, that the simple rules model that Mark talked about has an enormous amount of staying power in virtually every known legal system. And what does that mean? It, it starts off with notions of individual self-control or autonomy. Sometimes people use the uh, very evocative phrase self-ownership. Other times they simply say that people are entitled to the exclusive possession of their own body and to figure out what it is that they want to do. Uh, but of course, if anybody could do anything that they want, uh, then it turns out that the law is going to break down into a free-for-all. And so what you do is you find the first of the great social contract count. Uh, compromises. Everybody gives up his right to use force and fraud against other individuals in exchange for them giving up the same right to you. So when I look at my land use class uh, sitting in this room, uh, this is the kind of notion of implicit in-kind compensation. You don't have to have any cash. What you do is you figure out a set of rights that you have and a set of rights that you're going to go to, and you make a kind of rough but very powerful empirical judgment that people are going to be better off in the one world than they are with the other. And so that becomes the new baseline against which all things are done. At this particular point, you have to find ways to acquire property. We have the rules of occupation that do that. And then we have rules for the protection against the use of force and fraud on the one side. And these are also combined with a very strong set of rules that allow for contractual freedom in which people can dispose either of their labor or of their property that they've acquired. 
uh, in either simple or complex transactions. The simple transactions, in fact, are those uh, which involve an outright transfer of one thing from one person to another. The complex transactions are like partnerships and corporations and other kinds of associations where the divided interest in the particular things. And the key constraint here is that when you assemble all the pieces when there has been a division, it neither increases the right that the parties to the transaction have against the rest of the world or on the other side, increase the rights that the rest of the world have against you who are parties to this situation. So uh, you then have to do this, and what's the dominant mode of enforcement? Well, at this point, we switch to a slightly Cosian explanation, which says that transactions costs are gonna be extremely important in the way in which they shape the operation of various legal remedies. And so in the typical dispute that you have, uh, we use a model of what's known as corrective justice, in which one person will turn around and start to sue another person in order to recover some particular thing for some particular reason. And this goes way back to the Nicomachean ethics of Aristotle, where he says that uh, these are the rules that govern ordinary interaction. And the implicit text about this is there are two things going on. One is there's a normative or a moral theory about entitlements, which says, don't take my property and so forth. But there's also a vast administrative apparatus that has to be put into place in order to make good on the entitlements that are there. And so the question that you have to then ask in a real world setting is, how valuable are the entitlements and how costly is it going to be in order to achieve a way for their enforcement? And what typically happens in a sensible world is there are many entitlements which are extremely important but of relatively below value in any individual case. And by and large, you keep those out of the legal system and they tend to be enforced by a series of loose reciprocal norms of one kind or another. Uh, but there are other kinds of things which involve the use of force or the use of pollution that are sufficiently large uh, that what we do is we bring out the heavy artillery of a legal system. Well, Individual lawsuits turn out to be fine. Uh, but in this particular area, I want to stress because it becomes so important for modern administrative law uh, that there are two kinds of operations that take place which have a kind of a vicious multiplicative, multiplicative effect if you're not careful in the way in which you govern them. Uh, one of these has to do with the use of force. The other has to do with the use of fraud. And in the force case, it's easy to think about trespass as being one person bopping another person on the head but nuisances, which are non-trespassory invasions, uh, can be one of two sorts. Uh, they can either be individual cases going against other persons, or it turns out they could be massive emissions that infect an entire community in one form or another, either by one person or by many, many persons. And so what happens is you start to multiply the effect to be the force of fraud. Uh, what you discover is it turns out that it is no longer possible to use a system of private rights of action in order to enforce the entitlements that everybody respects. And so within the classical liberal framework, uh, what happens is administrative law is essentially a transactional device which has two characteristics. One is it allows for the efficient enforcement of rights by massing individuals on one side so as to reduce their transactions cost. And two, and with every bit of the same degree of importance, uh, what it also does is it makes it essentially impermissible for you to change the nature of the substantive entitlement as you change the nature of the public enforcement. Uh, so that what happens as you move from the public, from the private to the public sphere, the entitlements remain constant and traditional administrative law by and large tended to respect all of those kinds of constraints. And so if you're working within this particular kind of framework, it turns out that the only thing you care about when you go from a public to private enforcement system is in fact uh, the efficiencies on these kinds of operations. Now, when you start getting to the modern progressive state, that is no longer a constraint that binds everybody. Uh, as I talk about this constantly throughout the book, in virtually every situation where you see in modern days a move from the private to the public sector, two things could be done simultaneously. Uh, one of the things that could be done is to get more efficient entitlement, enforcement rather, and the other thing that you can start to do is you can now expand the set of entitlements in one way or another. And so if you think about what's going on there, as you expand the entitlements, it turns out the entire structure of administrative law is going to have to change. And as I've said to my students all the time, the great transformation is in the original common law setting. What happened is you have strong rights to exclude. 
which means on the flip side that those who are excluded essentially are going to have to bear certain kinds of losses without any degree of compensation whatsoever. And within the traditional framework, on these include light, air, views, competition. Uh, that is both the physical stuff and the economic stuff. And the classical phrase for this was damn the map square and Uria. Harm without legal injury. And the basic logic behind the system under these circumstances is really very simple. You have to bear those particular losses. And in exchange, you get the same kind of freedom with respect to your own ability to build, with your own ability to contract and so forth. And we have a reasonable confidence that if you allow both free construction on the one hand and you allow free competition on the other hand, the total output would be greater than it is under a system in which what you do is you try to create multiple rights in which nobody has a veto power over anybody else, but everybody else has a participation right uh, for the way in which the system works. So if, in fact, you think about this in this way, when you look at classical administrative law, it turns out that it's remarkably focused in what it does, which tends to eliminate the degree of discretion that one has with respect to the system as it starts to enforce its various kinds of rights. And so if you go back and you look at the 19th century cases, it's not that this is only a laissez-faire system of one form or another. It is, in fact, a system in which the precision and the definition of the rights is something that tends to explain away uh, the level of discretion which is associated with modern administrative of law. And there's no question that anybody who is a student of administrative law today, if they're asking what is the kind of thing that makes it really important that you uh, worry about things today, it's the degree of discretion under a system in which entitlements turn out to be surprisingly weak because they're always contestable at one level. Uh, one way in which to sort of illustrate this, and it's a very nice way to do it, it was a kind of international situation, is to think about how it is that you regulate new resources. And the new resource that I'm going to talk about here just for the second uh, turns out to be uh, the ability to engage in telecommunications of one form or another. Uh, there is no question that uh, you go back and you do your classic and Roman law and other types of system, nobody anywhere has any idea that there is a spectrum because until you develop the technology for its utilization, uh, essentially uh, this is just a dead resource. But once it comes out, then the question is, how is this thing going to be allocated? And there are two ways in which you can allocate this particular stuff. Well, one of them is you could try to do it unilaterally by first possession rules, similar to those with property. And the others, you can try to do it through some kind of an administrative state. Uh, if you do the first one, the way the system will emerge is the way it did emerge. People will start to sit on a piece of spectrum and then somebody else will see that, oh, you're broadcasting over that. We'll move over a little bit and we'll find ours. If you assume that there's a relatively slow rate of entry and you have a relatively limited band, people will start to position themselves so they're within the band but have maximum difference from everybody else. The difficulty comes in when, of course, it turns out that the number of entrants is so large relative to the technology that everybody begins to interfere with everybody else. And so the classical liberal response to this particular situation is we need good fences to make good neighbors. And so in the United States and in other countries, what you want to do is to call on this very chaotic set of rights with high interference levels and then give yourself a defined set of frequencies uh, under which the broadcast can take place with tolerable levels of interference. And this is actually a tricky notion because the more powerful the equipment you have, the narrower the band that you need in order to transmit the information in question. So the initial view about this particular subject is what you do in the spectrum is to create a system of boundary lines and then start to enforce them. If in fact you have to do this administratively, or what you try to do through the administrative system is to figure what the optimal width of the bands are, and then to deal with the question of how you allocate it, what you do is you sell these things off and they become strong and robust property rights, which means in effect that the use and the development of these particular rights can take place as the owner would want to see fit so long as they observe the external constraints and they don't emit stuff to their neighbors. So this is essentially an equivalent to a world in which you could build whatever kind of factory you want. You don't have to explain it to anybody else, but if you start to emit pollution or schmutz or dirt to somebody else, then in effect, there could either be a private or a public response that will stop that nuisance. And in effect, that is a perfectly sensible way to go uh, because what typically happens is when you do that, it's like somebody who owns a home 
you'll try to figure out what the maximum efficiency is of this particular system. And as in other particular cases, you'll also make deals with your neighbors if it turns out that you think that the two of you together can increase uh, the total output relative to what it previously was. And that in the spectrum turns out to be a very common property and situation because if it turns out you've got two bands, one like this and one like that, the overlap is going to be great. If you, in fact, can get two neighbors to come together, uh, then one boundary line is removed and you probably can get a higher carrying capacity uh, within the area of the two uh, than you can with the one. How far you want to go would be a question of market choice, I think, uh, but generally speaking, you'd go somewhere. And that way, in effect, what would happen is you make no centralized judgments as to the technology that's to be used or the purposes to which that particular technology is going to be put or the way in which you could subdivide the frequencies by contract, including leases, partial sales, mortgages, and the like. Uh, when this thing actually came up into the administrative state, uh, the, it was right at the cusp. And in 1926, it was organized in the United States by Herbert Hoover, a noted progressive. And then all of a sudden, the aspiration started to change. And there's a very famous, well-known decision by uh, Felix Frankfurter in 1943. And what that particular decision started to hold was whether or not when the United States through the Federal Communications Commission has authority over the, over the frequencies, what ought it to do? And Frankfurt was somebody who spent a large part of his intellectual career explaining the many fatal weaknesses associated with one or another kind of libertarian theory. Um, and he was openly scornful of all this stuff. And so he used to say, well, there's some people out there. Uh, he was looking at me, but I was just at that day four days old. Um, and he says, they really think that the only thing that the government ought to do is to determine the boundary lines between frequencies. But he says, we've got a better idea. What we're going to do is we're not going to determine the boundaries. We're also going to determine the composition of the trap. Um, so it's like somebody who's saying now that we have a system of property rights and homes, uh, we're going to tell you where your living rooms, where are going to be, whether you could have a dining room, whether you could have a winery or something of the sort. And he said, we have to do this. Now, note what happens is Frankfurt is no fool. And he realizes that if you have to allocate the frequency, there's no way that the United States Supreme Court would actually get into the nitty gritty of this particular stuff. Uh, so that what immediately happens is instead of having a relative precise system, which tells you what to do and how to do it, you now have to remand it to an agency saying, you've got to figure out what these optimal distributions of talent are going to be under these circumstances. Well, how do you do that then becomes a very, very fair question uh, that people are going to have to ask themselves. And uh, you're sitting at the Supreme Court. You don't know anything about this. And you know you don't know anything about this. Uh, so that what happens is you now start to move yourself to a world of delegation and discretion. Uh, you have to delegate it to an agency because they're the only ones who have the chance to do it. Everybody is going to have to have a say under these circumstances. And uh, so that what happens is when you start to make these kind of allocations, uh, what you discover, there's going to be a lot of contested judgments of one kind or another. But since you don't have any kind of a gold standard like the trespassory rules, it may means that the nature of the review that you're going to have through a legal system is going to be necessarily weaker because the ability to use a strong system of controls in any and all of these particular systems is vigorously and necessarily dependent upon your ability to develop a cognitive standard of what it is that you think ought to be done under these circumstances. And if you don't have any vision of what's going to be right or wrong, uh, then what's going to happen is you're going to believe much more in delegated authority on the one hand, and you're going to necessarily increase the degree of discretion associated with an administrative agency on the other hand in order to execute this particular stuff. And so the way to understand what's going on is that the dangers of the modern administrative state in virtually all cases stem from this one simple kind of phenomenon, uh, which is that when you look at the way in which these things start to work, and you realize that you can't figure out what the right answers are, you necessarily go to a system of delegation. And you necessarily go into a system of delegation, you go to a system associated with deference in the way in which this particular delegation is done. Uh, there is no way that you can escape this so long as you start to embrace a system uh, which believes that strong and exclusive property rights are the wrong way to go. Now, you then try to figure out what something like the FDA or the FCC does under these circumstances, and it turns out they don't know any more than you do. Uh, so what they do is when you don't have an idea of what's right and you don't put things out to bid, 
every time you do something, you have to resort uh, to a methodology, uh, which is one that I condemned, for example, in my Simple Rules book, is that you start to have a list of factors that people have to take into account. Uh, but you don't tell what their relative weight is, and you don't tell how any particular regime scores under any of these particular relative weights. And so that's exactly what, you know, after years the FCC did, and it turns out it has no idea what it's doing on these things. It loves local news, but on the other hand, it likes national coverage. It wants ethnic specialization, but it wants you to appeal to a general situation. It thinks it's extremely important that you have news programs, but on the other hand, entertainment really imagines as well. And so what they're trying to do is to make the terrible mistake of making each and every station or a kind of microcosm is the world it is. And if you want the analogy, it would be like you've got 10 stores on Main Street. And when you say that each of them has to be an emporium which carries exactly the same set of goods as everybody next door, whereas the correct way to do this is say, within the boundary line, you guys figure out what it is that you want to do, and then you can open up yourself to wares one way or another. And so one famous illustration about this is one of the problems that you have when you have very few networks and large numbers of frequencies is the simple question of how it is that you decide to serve minority communities, which is a non-trivial issue. And it turns out that if you only got three stations um, and so forth, and each of them has to do this as a block, if there are 10% of the people out there who want something different, nobody's going to want to serve them because it's better for each of these three to go after the 30% of the market. So one particular company came up with a bright idea of leasing out the spaces uh, to other individuals. And at that particular point, you know, the Greek for the Greek programming could take one hour, the Spanish could take three. And all of a sudden what you do is you get a smorgasbord. And the way in which you solve the problem associated with block booking is essentially to reduce the size of the block by entering into voluntary subtransactions. And when this came before the DC circuit, what they did is they invalidated the license because they said it turns out that it's only the licensee from the government who has to make these substantive decisions. It cannot be something which they delegate uh, to other individuals privately. And so market solutions become absolutely blocked out of this. And this creates an immense kind of difficulty because what you did is when you went into the public solution, you changed the substantive rights. Let me give you another illustration having to do with environmental protection on the other side of this situation, which I think kind of shows the same difficulty coming up in a, in a somewhat different fashion. Uh, so what happens is, uh, as I mentioned to you, are there are these rules which talk about at the common law that you have no right to write and to air over somebody else's property. And there's a famous decision involving the Fontainebleau Hotel uh, back in Florida, which said that if somebody builds a high tower and blocks the light and the shadow on somebody else, uh, there's no compensation. It's damn the maps in Europe. But at that particular point, the decision then makes an absolutely fatal mistake because it says if you really want to get this kind of protection, uh, what you ought to do is to pass a zoning ordinance which limits the heights of these various buildings, and you could therefore change the substantive right. So now think of the way in which the political dynamics are going to play out if you start to use this particular form uh, of control. Uh, what's going to happen is the guy who loses under the common law rules is now going to march off to the legislature. And if he or she can find enough compatriots who have similar views before a zoning board and so forth, what they can do is they can put in a height limitation of one kind or another, uh, which will necessarily favor the person who wants to keep the views and hurt the other guy. And if you do this without compensation, then the question is, well, just how high do you want this wall to be? And are you sure uh, that the gains that you get from the one tenement is going to offset and be greater than the gains that you get from the other side? You can't figure that out. But what you do know is that this is going to be a polycentric hearing in which everybody can start to come in. And then you can start to redefine pollution in any way, shape, or form that you want uh, so as to limit the ways in which various structures can go up. Or you can define it in the opposite direction so as to allow large things to happen, which might not otherwise take the place. Now, if in fact you have a different kind of system, the one that I'm talking about, you don't have that polycentric degree of control. And if you don't have that polycentric degree of control, then the only way in which you can decide to protect the guy with the Serbian tenement who wants that light is to condemn out the air rights of somebody else. Something which you don't have to do under American law after the Penn Central decision, because it turns out air rights are not treated as a discrete property interest. They're simply treated as an extra tag on to the land issues that you have. In these particular cases, they get no independent protection. 
And the moment you don't give independent protection and there's no pricing system that you could use to compare the relative values to the one party or the other. So as I always like to say about the eminent domain power, the most important applications of the domain power are not situations where you actually take something and pay for it. The most important situations in many cases where the price is sufficiently high that you realize it's just not worth buying it in the first place. And so what happens is if it turns out that the guy who wants to put up this building is going to give huge numbers of customers very attractive views, and the other fellow is just going to have a slightly better swimming pool, uh, there's going to be no deal there. Or if there is going to be a deal there, um, it's going to be a deal which is going to compromise, cut down the height a little bit here, and give a little bit of money there, uh, so that if you have a price system, you're going to get searches for intermediate solutions. If you get a regulatory system, it's going to be exactly the opposite way. And anybody who's ever worked with zoning boards will realize that since compensation is never on the table, and majority votes always take over, uh, that what happens is you get huge amounts of protectionist legislation that upset competition, all known on the names of creating various kinds of balances in communities, that this process then takes place through a series of bargaining arrangements, which gives rise to the problem of the doctrine of unconstitutional condition. Can I tell you that you're allowed to build your particular building only if you now are going to protect somebody else's view or give somebody else a right of way over your particular land, um, which you would never have to do at the common law. Uh, so the level of discretion that you start to get becomes very, very much larger. Well, that's two cases. Now let me give you a third type of situation, which is extremely important because most of the major cases that define the modern structure of American administrative law, at least, occur in the post-New Deal period. Even to be a bit more precise than that, they take place either during the Second World War when things start to get sorted out, or just after the Second World War, when all of a sudden the obvious imperatives of beating the Germans and the Japanese are no longer there. And there are a pair of cases known as the Chenery cases that start to deal with the question of what you do with an SEC. And if you recall, when I started to talk about these stuff to begin with, is I said that essentially what happens if you're trying to deal with uh, the classical liberal view of the administrative state is that you're trying to find more efficient remedies to deal with fraudulent behavior, including non-disclosure and concealment. And one of the reasons why the SEC has some fairly useful legs associated with this particular operation is that it turns out it is at least as stated a systematic anti-fraud kind of operation. And what it's supposed to do is given a large diffuse class of shareholders who find it very difficult to protect themselves is to give a watchdog to prevent various kinds of self-dealing from undermining the confidence in the market. And one reason why we know that there's a certain degree of logic and sense to this particular situation is that if you ask all sorts of individual firms uh, whether they're in favor of FCC enforcement of their own internal regulations, the answer is they are. And the reason they are is they recognize that as a business, uh, the kinds of self-dealing that can undermine them is something that's very difficult for them to detect on an individual basis. It's very difficult to form a voluntary consortium that could cover the market. And what the SEC can do is to get a set of data together, which can allow it to identify insider trading, uh, which would compromise the, uh, the integrity of these markets, and then to stop those people from doing it. Now, why do you want to do that? Well, the simplest case comes as follows. I am now about to buy a corporation. And what I would like to do for my client is to buy this corporate, that is I'm the representative, at the lowest possible price. So I've got somebody in my firm who now knows that this is going to happen and will realize that there'll be an upward movement in the value of the stock when as and if this particular tender offer is made public. So what he does is he goes out on the sly and he starts to buy some shares and puts them into his own account. That drives the price up a little bit, uh, which means that the a firm that is trying to do this thing is going to have to go into a tougher market because its own representative has essentially portrayed its fiduciary duty. And there's no question that every single firm that you will see um, when they hire lawyers, when they hire investment buyers of one kind or another, always engage in the sort of behavior which just can't do this sort of thing at all. And what you have to do under these circumstances is not trade in order to be a loyal agent for us. And the point of this fiduciary rules is to make sure uh, that when the SEC comes in, uh, that these things are going to be respected. So it's the old model. What we do is with the administrative state is try to enforce a set of common law entitlements uh, that resist enforcement uh, because of the transactions cost obstacles. When you get to the Chenery case though, it turns out it's a very different kind of situation. 
Uh, there what you did is you had a company and there was going to be a various transformations and during the 1930s under the public utility holding act and other statutes there were lots of bankruptcies in which there had to be lots of reorganization and typically with a reorganization what happens is that those people who have the preferred or the protected positions get everything before the common shareholders get anything. And so in this particular case, the preferred shareholders were entitled to wipe out the common shareholders because there simply wasn't enough to satisfy the interests of these two claims. All right, you start with that kind of a situation. What's the next thing that happened? is you now have to figure out what kind of preferred shareholders get what. And what the SEC did is they said there were a bunch of insiders in this particular session who bought in the market like everybody else, did not engage in any kind of wrongful conduct, but what it said is these particular preferred shareholders can only receive interest on their initial investment, where all the other preferred shareholders essentially can receive the market rate of return and all the appreciation, including the appreciation on the shares that are going to be down. Uh, so it, you can show, and this would I think be the case, uh, that the insiders had engaged in wrongful trading of any form whatsoever, non-disclosure, concealment, separate information, then in effect, they would be subject to sanction. And there are other kinds of provisions which are prophylactic, and if you violated those, you could be subject to sanction. But in this particular case, it turned out that there was nothing whatsoever that went on uh, that would invoke any of the common law or statutory duties in question. And so at this particular point, what the administrative state is doing is it's saying, we know what a fiduciary duty is, and now we're going to impose upon you other kinds of duties that are not related to the common law rule. Well, the question is, what's the efficiency justification uh, for wiping out one class of shareholders for the benefit of another if you've not been able to prove that they've engaged in any kind of wrong? And so if you are within the common law framework, the moment you get back to the linguistic question and you hear a term like fiduciary duty, you cannot treat that term as though it's infinitely malleable uh, so that anybody can do whatever it is that they want under these circumstances. What you have to do is to go back to the usual cases of non-disclosure, concealment of material information, or the use of fraudulent representations to do it. And what happened is the intermediate court judge understood this, uh, but a combination of Felix Frankfurt and Frank Murphy, they're progressives. And so they say, you know, we can redefine what's right or wrong. We can define fraud in any way we want, it, just the way we can define pollution in any way that we want to. And what that does in effect is it vastly increases the scope of the administrative state and it does exactly the thing that you don't want to do. It increases the insecurity of property interests because of the ability of the uh, government agencies to wipe them out with a stroke of the pen. And instead of creating investment competence, it creates exactly the opposite situation. Now you can go through this with statute after statute in each and every case in which you start to find exactly these things. So um, I'm gonna start to wind up in a little bit, uh, but I then take some questions, but let me just sort of go back first and say, well, what about the 19th century? How did all of that stuff work and why was it so different? Well, first on both the fraud question and the environmental question, I think it's pretty clear that 19th century law uh, did not push extremely hard in the development of things to deal with these issues. Um, uh, these things become intense only as you start getting higher levels of industrial production, and that's going to start taking place only after the Civil War. Uh, but it turns out there were a whole variety of other things that they had to do, and it was interesting to see the way in which they, they wanted to do them. And so the first thing what they had to do is they had to run an economy in which it turns out that the government gets employees. And uh, these can be military employees, they can be civil employees. And I don't care who you are, if you're going to hire somebody, you have to figure out how to pay them. You have to figure out whether to promote them, to give them pensions, when to fire them, when to transfer them, and so forth. And the question is, what kind of rules do you start to do in this? And what the 19th century judges did was very interesting. They say on these kinds of things, we certainly have to defer to the expertise of the agency and the operation of what's going on. And somebody like Justice Stevens and Chevron said, aha, you see this 19th century discussion, so we're doing nothing different from everybody else. Did. But it turns out that he meant in the 20th century, the exact opposite of what the 19th century judges meant. For those of you who remember your common law of contracts, uh, both in Canada and the United States, uh, there's the following basic kind of situation. 
uh, which is if you have a written contract and you're trying to figure out what it means, you start with the written terms of the test as ordinarily understood in the language. It's a kind of contractual originalism, which is not all that different from constitutional originalism. Uh, but like everything else, language is a little bit more complicated than that. And if it turns out that you've got a very small community of people which use terms in somewhat idiosyncratic way, and both parties to the deal understand what the idiosyncratic terms are, the idiosyncratic terms will displace the standard meaning. And so in many cases, you discard that a dozen concludes 13 people or 13 cakes or buns or whatever it is. And that's the way you do it because the industry understands that. And taking in parole evidence to do that is not asking people whether he did or did not promise to make this kind of warranty or that kind of warranty. It's evidence about a common industry-wide practice, which is much more reliable to introduce than everywhere else. And so when the 19th century judges started to say they deferred to practice, what they meant under the circumstances were if there was a continuous practice in the way in which you dealt with a pension issue or a payment issue or a dismissal issue and so forth, uh, what we would do is defer to the continuous situation. What that meant is if there was somebody inside the government administration who decided that he wanted to deviate from the standard practice and do something idiosyncratic, either to squash an individual or to give him a special benefit, the rule at the time was you were never allowed to do that. And this is exactly the opposite of what is meant by Chevron deference, where in effect, if you decide to change your practice without doing any notice whatsoever, uh, that's perfectly okay because we defer to administrative agencies and therefore allow for enormous kinds of flip-flop. And this came, for example, to the head when we started to deal with the rules dealing with who is an investment advisor and who is a broker. Um, there was a very interesting opinion by Edith Jones in the Fifth Circuit dealing with this when the Obama administration decided that it would ditch 40 years of established practice in order to put on a definition which made every broker an investment advisor and subject them to huge kinds of liabilities that were not otherwise the case. And if, in fact, you take the modern view of administrative law, that deference means any last opinion can change anything else, uh, that's going to be a sound decision. But if you go in the opposite direction, and what you come up with is a system which says, no, if there's been a continuous practice and somebody wants to break it, they're no longer a hero, as Justice Stevens would have them. They're a renegade in the way in which the 19th century judges would start to look at the situation. And so it turns out that deference is an extremely complicated notion. And if you defer to consistent practices, what you do is you get rid of flip-flops and you get rid of caprice and you allow administration to work in areas where they have greater knowledge than you do. Uh, but if you if they say any rogue can change the rule over anybody else, uh, then you get yourself a very, very different situation. And this is also important because it then ties into another issue, which is where do these responsibilities lie? And I'll end on this note because I want to leave a little bit time for questions. One of the things that I said is the administrative state uh, has this very strange view about the way in which you look at separation of power. Uh, the traditional tripart situation under the American Constitution goes way back to a Roman and Greek political theory. We have a legislature that makes laws, an executive that enforces them, and a judiciary that interprets them. There is not a single person in the world who believes that all of these things are self-explicating in each and every case. But by the same time, because you can find difficult cases at the margin on such questions as delegation, it doesn't mean that the basic framework is silly and that you short to say that anybody can do anything at any particular kind of time. And so if you want to go to a very important issue, the question is, when are grants final? And these grants can be of two sorts. They can be land grants in which the government actually has property in its own reserve and it gives it off to somebody else. Or they could be patent grants, which are much more complicated because it's not as though the government has the patent in its own possession. What happens is somebody makes an application, meets all the particular standards, uh, they go through a review and an examination, and then the patent is issued. And the question then is, when are these things fine? The 19th century view about this was very, very clear, is that the patent becomes final and the land grant becomes final when the government signs off on it. And at that particular point, its enforcement and interpretation uh, becomes a judicial function rather than an executive function. And this means, in effect, that what you do is you get a neutral body to decide whether or not this particular patent, be it for land or whether it's for something else, is in fact valid under the standard rules. And adjudication takes over in the normal place. 
under the recent America Invents Act, what they did is they inverted this situation and they announced that the same administrative agency that issued the patents could decide on their particular validity. And the first thing you want to do is you never, never, ever want to put the people in charge of doing something in charge of adjudicating whether or not what they've done is correct. And one of the great mistakes of the modern administrative state is that the rules on bias are always weakened because the property rights have been weakened on which these rules protect. And then you start looking at these administrative agencies and you realize there's a lot going on there. Uh, so before it was corrected in the uh, Trump administration, there was a nasty practice when you did this to say, oh, we have to review this thing. Somebody's come here. And the first panel decides it's going to be two to one in favor of the patentee. And the patent office tends to be anti-patent. So what they do is they expand the, juris the, the number of judges to do it. So they got five judges instead of three. We hear the case. Now it comes out three, two the same way. And then the chief of the patent office decides to put himself and his associate chief on the panel. So they organize their own panels and they reverse the thing four to three. These are not hypothetical cases. This is exactly the way in which the system started to operate. And so what is it that you start to learn from this? All the prophylactic rules about separation of powers as a guard against abuse are in fact extremely important in the modern times as they were before. And these apparently innocent, simple-minded rules that say once you issue a patent, it's final um, and therefore has to be adjudicated in the ordinary course of business is in fact absolutely consistent uh, with the standard traditional views of administrative law in which the ordinary law of the land uh, without ad hoc situations is what does interpretation. And when you start getting to the modern administrative state, uh, you now can get rid of these separation barriers. So if you put the whole piece together, and I go through case after case in my book as to how all this is done, what you discover is that the older guys essentially had the right basic conception and they usually came out with the right answer. And the modern guys have much greater levels of ambition. They're trying to judge multiple balls in the air at any particular time. And generally speaking, when you put multiple balls in the air and you're trying to get them all to work at the same time, you can make the following simple conclusion about what happened. Um, it's like a juggler. They're gonna start to fall and clatter on the floor. And so the basic plea in the book is to say, you know, we have a more complicated state and you can never get back to the simple 19th century. But every change that you want to make should not be to celebrate the sophistication of the discretionary administrative state, but should be tried to have done something in order to hem it in so that the levels of delegation, the level of abuse, the level of systematic uncertainty, uh, the level of vast encroachment upon private rights can be subject to some form of limitation. Well, I'm now quite happy since I talked for 44 minutes or whatever it is to take any question, Mark, you could come out from the dark and anybody who has a question, just raise their hand. Or, I don't even know what I'm supposed to do, but. Um, yeah, well, perhaps we can, uh, if anyone has any questions, if you could uh, type them maybe into the chat box. And we'll or just, just, re just call them out. Or just call I'm, them out, yeah. Uh, mute yourself. Uh, does anybody have something? Come on. Somebody has to have something. You start, Mark. Okay, I'll start. Yes. So in Canada, you mentioned uh, practice and uh, deference to longstanding practices. In Canada, we just had a big redo of our law of judicial review. And basically the position taken in the Canadian courts now is that uh, uh, deviations from longstanding administrative practice deserve deference so long as they are explained and so long as they are justified. Is that doctrinal rule, is that, uh, would that be okay in, in sort of your view or is that, is that just not enough still? The problem is what's going to count as a good explanation, right? Right. So let me give you a very simple situation. One of the things that we do is we have a very strong suspicion under modern law about freedom of contract in ordinary labor markets, something which I have fought for my entire academic career, saying competitive labor markets outperform minimum wage laws, union laws, this, that, and the other one. So what happens is you've got one of these systems in place. And in my own view, you, you really want to get rid of them. But now what suppose somebody says is, oh, what we've done is we have a law and we're going to change it. We're justifying this because it's going to give greater protection for incumbent workers, which is a justification, right? Well, I mean, that sounds like a justification, but what it is, in fact, is it's a form of protectionism. 
And what happens is we see in so many of these particular cases is that the modern versions of justification, when they're tied to no particular substantive theory, can move in both directions at the same time. So one of the cases you teach in American law is a case called Lingle. And the justification that was put forward in this particular case is we put in a thoroughly absurd set of cartel-like regulations in place because the state has a legitimate interest in keeping gasoline prices low. But then I turn, you turn to the Agricultural Adjustments Act, and now it turns out that you have administrative intervention, and the social justification for that is to keeping the price of agricultural goods higher, right? And so if it turns out that the notion of justification that you have is so utterly plastic uh, that virtually any substantive conclusion that you wish to defend is going to be consistent with it, and then it's just a shame. And the reason why the classical liberal theory is pretty clear on that is it does not have the same equivocation that modern progressivism has on the single most important issue in labor. And that's the question is whether or not labor regulations can tend to monopoly, collective bargaining in a typical case, or exclusions of one form or another, or the competition. Um, so if you're a classical liberal and somebody wants to show you that I'm going to give you a form of regulation, like for example, the statute of frauds, which increases contractual velocity and therefore the gains from trade, you say you're facilitating voluntary markets, it's fine. But if in fact what you're now going to do is to have a special tax on all of these transactions of one kind or another, uh, that's not fine. So to give you an illustration that I talk about with land use, but it's an important one today, is in many communities you have various kinds of rental properties. This happens in Canada and the United States. And somebody comes along and says, well, we really think it's important to keep rental property. So if you want to convert this rental property into a condominium, what you have to do is essentially to justify uh, or excuse yourself by either finding a like number of units or paying a fee which can be used to devote to these things. Now, under modern administrative law, that would count as a justification. It's been repeatedly upheld in the United States. And then you start looking at what happens is it freezes uh, resources into their lowest value use because the in lieu fee is a tax. And so assume in the simplest model that the units in question are worth, say, $100 in their current form, and they're worth 150 in their reverse form. And now the government's going to come along and impose a $75 tax on mm. this thing. Can't take place. And you're going to say, oh, well, they've given a justification for this. So if your class of justifications under modern administrative law is as open as is the sun, then you can justify anything at any particular point in time. And so this model only makes sense if the set of justification is in fact not infinitely open-ended. Mm -hmm. And when you start looking at modern administrative law, they come up with the greatest situation. Now, sometimes it gets really ugly. So let me give you another illustration. Uh, and this is, I'll go back to the 19th century and in America. And generally speaking, when we had a case like Lochner against New York, it was held that it was not a sufficient justification for this thing uh, uh, to show uh, that work is kind of so-called safety interest in this 10 out. They struck the thing down because they realized it was an effort to shift from non-union to union labor for a variety of reasons we don't have to mention, that it was in reality a protectionist statute. Uh, at the same time, five years earlier, there's a case called Plessy v. Ferguson. And instead of having a very narrow view of the police power, it had a very broad view of the police power. And the board view of the police power was, well, it's perfectly legitimate to put into place segregation in schools, segregation on railroads, uh, anti-miscegenation laws in marriages, because the justification that we have is the purity and the separation of the races, right? I mean, so you play that game in any yeah. particular period, you can do just about anything. So what happens is the notion of a justification has in sense to be congruent with the underlying theory. And the reason why I'm so passionate about classical liberalism is that the kinds of justifications that they have there will tend to lead to development on the one hand, open competition on the other, and remove all the barriers to entry of groups that are dispossessed in some sense. So if anybody's sitting there as part of a racial or religious minority, and they're in a world in which you start having entries to barrier, we know who's gonna be hit first. And so knocking those things down are much more valuable to people than guaranteed slots, or to put it in, a, in the crudest way possible on the whole issue now. Is it more important for a member of a minority to have a fair shot at getting a job or a guaranteed position under an affirmative action rule? And the former is a much more valuable right for society than the latter, because what it does in effect, it eliminates the state from the heavy hand that it starts to put on these things, 
where it can make all sorts of quotas of one kind or another, uh, which are going to be really quite perverse in a various situation. So I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, that is in the abstract. Yes, every time you have a freedom restriction, you may be able to justify. So in common law, uh, you certainly can justify a restriction on the sale of guns if you know that the recipient of the gun is going to use it to kill his neighbor, right? It's an enchant. And they're also saying you can't sell alcohol after a certain hour. Uh, but you know that these are restrictions in which basically what you're saying is if I try to stop them wrong at the moment of its occurrence, the remedy is too inadequate. So what I have to do is to go back one level and, you know, how much of a liberty restriction is it to tell people they can't buy a drink um, at two o'clock in the morning relative to the folks who are going to be heard on the wall? And so you then have these trade-offs about whether the kind of harm that's avoided relative to the kind of harm that's inflicted by regulation, which way the balance of equity goes. Nobody can avoid that. If that's what you're trying to do, I'm all in favor of it. Uh, but if you're trying to say, no, I mean, we have to have an artificial rule here in which it turns out that 20% of your workforce has to be over 70 years of age, uh, no use for that whatsoever. So I think, in effect, the, the theme of the book, and I'll stress it again here, you can't do administrative law as a procedural exercise independent of the substantive rules that you're trying to defend and trying to enforce. And if you try to do that, you're always going to get things wrong. You're going to screw it up in securities law. You're going to screw it up in discrimination law. You're going to screw it up in environmental law. And I am not a traditional administrative lawyer who thinks that the only thing you want to do is to figure out which kind of deference is used in what kind of case under step one, two, or three. I've always thought if administrative law is an age of substantive law, if you get the substantive law right, you'll never get the administrative law. If you get the substance of law right, you can get the administrative law right. If you get the substance of law wrong, the administrative law is going to be wrong as well. So now somebody else with a question, I hope. Come on. Why is this? I have a, I have a question for you, uh, Professor. Oh, thank you so much. Kent? Yes, from uh, Toronto. Good. So the question that I have for you is one about the, the, practical, uh, the practical implementation of your ideas here. One thing about Canada is we are such a vast administrative state. The one example I like to use is you can't build a pipeline, an energy pipeline in this country because you get administrative approval from an energy regulator and then an environmental regulator overturns it. Then a court gets involved. Then a human rights uh, uh, view gets yeah. taken on it. And so you've got the administrative state tripping over itself. So one other problem we have, of course, in Canada is we have a lack of uh, judicial uh, resources. So we, we don't appoint judges fast enough to be able to deal with the black letter law. W what are some practical ways that we can claw back this administrative <sighs> state in, in a world where judicial resources are being uh, reduced at the expense of the multiplicity of administrative states that, like I said, scope creep and trip over each other? Okay, now look, I th this problem, uh, one of the things I didn't talk about is the last section of my book is devoted to pipelines because essentially they prevent exactly these kinds of problems. So let me state the problem in many ways. Uh, you got half of it, but it's even worse than that, as you well know. Uh, that is, I, I've written several papers about property rights as squares and property rights as long and skinny. Um, and it turns out, you know, this is not just a question of simple geometry. Uh, the moment something becomes long and skinny under these particular circumstances, uh, what happens is you're going to be subject to multiple jurisdictions because there's no point in having a pipeline that simply goes around in a circle and brings the stuff to where it ends. So there's the Keystone Pipeline going into the United States and Canada. We've been trying to get pipelines, I guess, from Alberta through to Vancouver, if I'm not mistaken. All of these things in both countries have been constantly stymied. Uh, so you're aware of, of the huge situation. Now, what's the correct way to think about this sort of stuff is uh, the first thing you want to ask yourself and you start to put these pipelines together is, is what is it that you're trying to prevent? And, you know, the way in which I look at this is that pipeline is a potentially dangerous situation. And what you're trying to protect against is leakage. Um, from these particular pipelines. I don't think when you regulate a pipeline, what you're trying to do is to regulate the end use of the stuff that goes through the pipeline any more than when you sell gasoline at a pump. Uh, what you do is you come up and you say, the gasoline company now has to monitor everybody who wants to fill it up, whether it's a pickup truck or a trolley or anything else like that. Uh, so you, you, first of all, you have to always limit the objections that you're trying to do. And let's just start first with the nuisance one. 
Uh, the first thing that one wants to do is that you always have to have ex ante and ex post kinds of review. And the issue is what's the correct way in which to do this. And when I've written about this, and if you're curious, there's a paper I wrote, uh, what was it called? The Many Sins of NEPA, because NEPA is the American statute that deals with some of these problems, National Environmental Policy Act, is what they always do is they try to overload the front end review of these processes. Now, why do you know that that's wrong? Because there've been many complicated projects that have been built by private parties without government supervision, right? And so you ask, what do they do? And the answer is they have a distributed process. You always begin with some kind of overall view when you put together architectural plans to be reasonably confident the building is not going to topple when you start to put this thing up and kill everybody on the street. Uh, but as you start to go along, what you realize in every complex business situation, uh, the single most important category is contract is modification and review, taking into account changed and unanticipated circumstances. And every institutionalist realizes that the last thing you want to do to govern that particular problem is to have a doctrine of frustration or impossibility that you apply judicially when everything has fallen together. So what you do is you internalize and institutionalize changes of review. And so you have agriculture, all these projects have meetings in which the contractors, the subcontractors, the owners and the architects get together on a weekly basis and they figure out what's gone wrong and how it is that they're going to fix it. In addition to that, what you do is you have liability rules. So if it turns out that something blows up or leaks, there are damages. And in order to make sure that those are efficiently enforced, you get insurance and the insurance companies are monitored. So a private distribution of powers independent of government is a very suggestive way to think about how the government ought to do these things. And front loading everything on the system is exactly the wrong way to go. And so what typically happens is you see here a true recognition of the fact uh, that you cannot, in environmental cases dealing with long-term projects, wait for an imminent peril to take place before you enjoin an equitable situation. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you have to solve everything before you can do anything. What it means is you get rid of the big problems now, and then you constantly upgrade the system to handle it. And if you get that kind of a frame, and then you start looking at the progress in pipeline regulation, uh, you realize that essentially the problems of leakages and explosions or whatever it is that you want to talk about that um, is in every major technology, these things are sharply down from what they were 25 years ago, uh, probably by a factor of between 80 and 90%. And so the first thing you realize is the longer you keep older equipment into use, the higher the risk of damage that you're going to see with respect to its operation. And so when you want to judge the baseline, you don't look at the new baseline and say, oh, you could create X elements of harm what you have to do is to say, are you going to eliminate 100 X elements of harm by getting some older piece of equipment out of use where it causes some harm? And with pipelines, that's a very common situation because if you don't do them using old pipelines, you're using buses, rather trains, and you're using trucks and so forth. And since they're not controlled environments like a pipeline, they're much more prone to various kinds of damage. So you have to do that. Then it turns out that you get the this, this stuff, you mentioned the environmental equity stuff, which is the same as it is in the United States. You're always worried about some sort of disproportionate impact against somebody else. Well, the way in which you handle that quite simply is when you build the pipeline, uh, you ask yourself the following question. Some of it's going through Indian territory, which is I'm sure an issue in Canada as well, right? And some of it's going through poor territory and some is going everywhere else. So now look at the specifications of a pipeline and ask yourself the following question. Do you see that the specifications for safety on the pipeline are systematically reduced when you're in Indian territory and poor people's territory relative to what it is when you're moving through prosperous farms? And of course, if you're building a pipeline and you have non-uniform specifications, you might as well put a gun to your head, right? And watch the whole thing kind of explode. And so you insist upon non-discrimination, which is a requirement that the firm has to do in order to run itself. You can't manage a pipeline if you have different safety standards for each individual on there. And so that's going to take care of itself. Interestingly enough, uh, the siting issue is much more difficult, not for pipelines, but it is for waste disposal subjects because those are short and squat, right? And you could put them in the middle of a very poor neighborhood and have people breathing poisonous air. I'm much more sympathetic to reviewing those things because one of the things that we know about environmental hazards, and we don't want to be silly about this, is we know that essentially the ability to pay is not going to be the appropriate test as to where these things want to be located because there are all sorts of non-pecuniary interests that people have in their ability to keep their lungs intact that have to be respected. 
And the technology is of importance in this case because the level of emissions and breakdowns on these things has dropped hugely, hugely in the last 25 years, so there's less of a problem. Uh, the third thing that people want to do, and I think this is just completely wrong, it's the effect doctrine which says it's not what's in the pipeline that matters, it's what happens when it gets out of the pipeline and somewhere else. And so uh, we're going to basically want to shut down the use of fossil fuels. So many environmental groups believe that the, the secret of this business, if you shut down the pipelines, you shut down the distribution, you starve the system, and people are going to have to switch to solar energy, wind energy, or whatever it is. Well, I'm not going to say categorically at this moment that that's an illegitimate concern. But what I am going to say is that's something that should be handled in one of two ways. Look at the end facilities and see whether or not they're there. So if I'm running a pipeline and sending oil to an old plant that emits a lot of pollution, what you do is you stop the pollution at the old plant. You don't stop the pipeline. And in fact, if you allow that plant to be replaced by a newer plant, a lot of these problems would be there. But somebody says, well, you know, solar energy is much better. Well, I don't believe that. In one thing, most of the solar energy requires that you have a huge amount of fossil fuel energy in order to put the equipment up. Uh, very expensive. You have to cover all sorts of land. Uh, the way you know that solar energy is a very bit suspect is you always exempt solar and wind facilities from other ordinary environmental protection. For example, the Endangered Species Act. You can kill birds if you're a turbine. You can't kill it if you're a farmer and stuff like that. And again, you want consistent rules of enforcement there to prevent that. So the name of the game, in effect, is if you do all of this stuff, what happens is virtually all of the objections to these pipelines turn out to be almost absurd. They are perfectly standardized equipment. And so that if you decide to build a pipeline with the latest technology and you put it here, you put it there, the only unique features that you have to ask are, if you're going through a wetland, how do you lay the pipe? And if you're going through a mountain, how do you lay the pipe? But in some cases, these things get absurd. So in the United States, to give you an idea how crazy it can get, uh, you want to build a transatlantic pipeline underneath the Appalachians. And it crosses a lot of trails going north, south, under 600 feet of ground. And so what the environmental groups have argued is that when you run these evaluations, what happens is the trail service, which controls the surface, should be able to veto the operation of a pipeline uh, going for one eighth of a mile underneath it 600 feet away, so that instead of having one environmental review for the pipeline as such, you have to have 50 or 60, because that's the number of trails that you're going to concern. Uh, so they, these things become extremely vulnerable. And I think the real subtext in these particular cases is all the environmental protections that you start to see are not about the dangers from the pipeline as such. It's because of your concern about the use of the thing downstream. And that's an illegitimate concern under these circumstances. So, I mean, I, if you're curious about this, I mean, the book has a discussion of it and the massive dislocations that take place. And I, I think what happens is the very environmental goals that you want for clean energy are gonna be frustrated by these regulations on the pipeline, just as nuclear energy in the United States was killed over 40 years ago because of these endless administrative reviews on things that really did not matter. I mean, one of the things that's so hard, Kent, to figure out about administrative agency is you don't know who the rogue is. In some cases, it's the agency which is behaving like perfect jerks. And in other cases, it turns out it's the reviewing court who are creating like perfect clowns. And so one of the reasons why it's extremely difficult to figure out how it is you run this kind of system is you never know on which particular side of that particular line it falls. In dealing with the pipeline situation, generally speaking in the United States, the Army Corps of Engineers has done a pretty respectable job. The Obama administration, unspeakably bad, shutting down pipelines on the most frivolous kinds of reasons, having themselves to get overturned, in this case, by the Trump administration. I'm um, having to do with the Keystone, not the Keystone pipeline, uh, but the DAPA pipeline, the Dapota Access Pipeline and so forth, where the administrative behavior of the Obama administration was beyond irresponsible in terms of the way in which they tried to do this. So yes, it's a very important question and you have to be able to handle this. And if you look at the book, uh, the last 10 or 15 pages are devoted to pipeline because of their exceptional vulnerability. A uh, long and skinny is much more perilous Let's put it this way. It's easy to snip a long cord, right? And if you can shut down a thousand feet of a pipeline, a thousand miles of a pipeline are going to be going to waste. These are not invented numbers. When it turned about DAPL, all the battle was over 1,100 feet of a pipeline located about a half a mile away from an Indian reservation. 
and which the Obama administration was prepared to shut the whole thing down. Sunk cost. There's another problem, multiple permitting, you said, right? It, what happens is if you get the permits to build the first section, the environmental groups will say, well, wait till you get the permits to build all of them before you put anything in the ground. And so at that point, they know that the slowest guy stops it. And so if you then wait, it turns out the first permit becomes invalid because it's a permit to allow you to build for 180 days, right? And you'll never get anything done. Uh, so it seems to me you have to get the right substance abuse. I, I, I don't know, Mark, you're hidden again. Um, I have a question. Uh, I have a question for you. Oh, yes. Let's, I'd love to hear that. Bruce? Yes. Hi. hi Richard. Good. Good. Th love thank you hear. very much. Thank you very much for that. I, I agree with you entirely about the pipelines for sure. Um, I'd like to take you back a little bit to Mark's question and ask you how to find our way around the maybe what I call the, the, the paradox of, of administrative law or perhaps the, the rule of law conundrum. You mentioned that one of the keys to containing the administrative state mm -hmm. in the administrative law sense was to get the substantive rules right yep. instead of just giving, giving deference to these decision makers to do what they thought was right, which makes a lot of sense to me. Um, how do we... How do we deal with that in the, in the face of the reality that it is the legislative agenda now, uh, in a great many cases, to eliminate substantive rules? It is the legislative agenda to want to delegate unbridled discretion to figure these things out and not take responsibility for the policy judgments that they would otherwise make. So the, the rule of law conundrum is sort of this. On the one hand, it is the legislature saying, no, no, this is the way we want decisions to be made. But on the other hand, that approach is producing a situation in which nobody knows what the rules are, there's no certainty, everybody is, is subject to the particular inclinations of this particular tribunal mm -hmm. on this particular day. So you have rule of law versus rule of law, you have the separation of powers problem, which I think- Oil states, yeah. Exactly. Uh, and yet, when we think about what kind of standard to apply to a review question, it is the legislature that says in the statute, no, 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 leave these people alone. We don't want you reviewing these, th these decisions, even though they are uncertain, even though we've not provided you with a, a firm rule, it is the legislature now saying that, and so the effect is to give more deference to the executive branch, but that's an, a legislative decision. If, if a court was to say, no, 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 we can't do that, you are uncertain, we, we want to uh, apply a, a robust separation of powers idea, you're still stuck with the first proposition, which is, well, it was the statute that says this in the first place. So if we're going yeah. to apply that idea, we have to give the statute its due, and the statute says to leave them alone. So, well, it turns out if the legislature is the final word on everything, and it says it wishes to go to hell in a particular fashion, and there are no constitutional constraints, then that's the way you go. There's a famous line from Justice Holmes about that, um, which is said if the legislature wants you to turn square corners, i.e. things that you can't do, that's what we do. We're a willing agent of it. Uh, the point about all of this is that if you're talking about uh, popular democracy uh, and simple majoritarianism, that is an inevitable result. And so if it turns out you therefore have a constitutional regime that celebrates that, you are going to quickly find yourself into this kind of quagmire because the problem here is extremely difficult. Suppose you manage to 10 times get a system in which you keep the genie in the bottle by demanding particular rules uh, and guidance of the classical liberal form, right? Yeah. And then the 11th time, what happens is you go the other direction. What happens is you cannot reverse the thing um, by democratic processes. There's already so much stuff that's out there in so many different ways that it's exceedingly difficult to try to run this. Even if you get somebody who's quote, as determined as somebody like Ronald Reagan to do this in the United States or Margaret Thatcher in England, uh, if you actually check what's going on, is they change the second derivative meaning they don't reverse the flow 
on balance. So there's still more silly regulations and they're out of office than they were when they were in office. Uh, but what they do is they make the rate of increase like this, whereas the progressives will make the rate of increase like that. The gap between uh, the concave and the convex is really very large. So you run off, fight it, but it's not going to do it. So what happens is you have to believe in constitutional democracy. And what's the system about constitutional democracy? It goes back to the basic Lockean and classical natural law conception is that democracy is not the ultimate. The ultimate end is the articulation of a system of private rights uh, that are coherent amongst ordinary individuals that maximize the scope of freedom and by so doing maximizes their overall productivity. The maxim that I like to use in this stuff is you start with these common law rules, which lead generally speaking to a system that leads to competition. You realize that in some cases it's gonna break down just to give you a couple of the common illustrations. Overutilization of common pool resources is something that even you and I would agree you have to stop. Monopolization is a kind of danger that you have to deal with. And so starting in the late 19th century, you start getting common pool regulation rules on the one hand, they don't get it entirely right, but at least they're in the right ballpark. And you start developing antitrust and rate regulation system. But these are all done with an idea to make sure that, oh, you can't do whatever you want. You're doing rate regulation, it can't be confiscatory, right? Simple. You're doing antitrust, you can't basically destroy a competitive industry. If you start with that form of constitutionalism, and then when the courts are seeing what the legislature does in deviation from it, it's duty bound to sort of stop that from taking place. And for a very long period of time, American constitutional law did not go into an anxiety attack when they found something that was sort of clearly unconstitutional under this stand. In a very low methodical way, uh, they tended to strike down the wrong things that shouldn't have been done and let the others go through. One of the things I've written about elsewhere is if you start looking at the theories of rate regulation as they existed in the United States between say 1890 when it starts to hit and 1940, there's an immense level of sophistication on the part of these judges. God knows where they got it from, but they tended to get things right on, on really complicated issues like joint costs and stuff like that. They pretty much knew what they were supposed to be doing. If in fact you are a progressive, you don't believe in any of these constraints. So the constitutional stuff disappears, at which point what you're saying is going to be the necessary consequence. So to me, you have to start with the Lockean view, roughly speaking, which is the natural law view, is that uh, the rights that you have got to go are, are organized by some deep substantive theory that everybody understands. And the purpose of government is to preserve those rights to the extent possible by imposing taxes and other limitations upon you, which are designed to strengthen the rights that you have. So the simplest way to put this on taxation, is taxation is not supposed to be money that takes money from Epstein and gives it to Deaton. The taxation is supposed to put money into a common pool such that each of us, when we get back the government protection, uh, gets back a benefit which is greater than the tax that we've paid. So our private rights plus the tax benefits, less the tax costs, are going to leave us better off than we were before. That's the normative theory. If, in fact, you treat democracy as the ultimate end, then, in effect, all that's gone. And so to put it to you another way, suppose I could show you, which I don't believe, is that you know, having a benevolent dictator will get you a better regime uh, than having a democratic one. Uh, consistently respect private rights in a higher way. I would be in favor of that. Well, why am I not in favor of that? Because what happens, you put one guy in there and it's like the old poem, when she's good, she's very, very good, right? And when she's bad, she's horrid. And the problem that you always have with Hobbesian instability is that the horrid part is going to become an extremely important part of this overall picture. And so the whole system of popular election, checks and balances, vetoes, judicial review, and so forth, is to say it is worth investing a great deal of money to avoid the downside of having everything wiped out by a single guy who's so dangerous. Well, if that's the situation, then that's what explains and drives constitutionalism. But if you think that popular democracy and public participation are substantive ends as opposed to procedural means, I think it's wrong. So to give you another illustration of that, you know, there are the number of people who believe that democracy, democratic participation and full and open, robust debate is something that we all want to encourage. 
Well, in some sense, I think they're right because you'd get better results with debate. But if you think a local zoning board is the way in which you want the liberations to go, uh, you've got the wrong substantive system that you're putting into place there. So you've got to make sure that you're deliberating over the right things under the right set of constraint. And to the extent that you have non-discrimination rules, what it means is you can now put forward a proposal which can only benefit you if it benefits everybody else in equal proportion. And there's a tendency under those circumstances to get cooperative rather than non-cooperative solution. But if it turns out that you can have a system of transfers instituted through deliberation, then the tissue is to figure out how you get a winning coalition of 50% or 52% and wipe out everybody else, which is the way in which this system works. So the way you have to do this is say the rule of law does not simply begin with the question of how do we get faithful enforcement of legislative decrees. The rule of law begins, how do we make sure that when we put this system together, the legislative decrees will have a certain degree of coherence that are associated with their operation. Is that fair, I think, Bruce? Yes. No, I, I, it makes a lot of sense to me. I, I, I agree with what you say. Thank you. But, but in terms of the administrative law problem itself as we n now have it, so let's just take these two choices. The choice between, on the one hand, allowing a decision maker to have a very wide degree of deference and to come to inconsistent decisions day after day after day, on the one hand, even though that's what the statute says to do, to leave them alone. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, to go against the statute and say, no, 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 the rule of law demands that the citizens are entitled to some kind of knowledge about what the situation is. Yeah, and so that gets you into lawn full of proceduralism, yeah. which is not a bad idea, notice, hearing, participation, deliberation, and so forth. And there's no question that to the extent that you get multiple kind of frictions in these particular cases, what it does is it prevents you from going to the extreme tail. But it also may prevent you from getting some decent substantive regulations because now uh, you have a system of open participation which results in a men's veto box um, of one kind or another. So it's a really extremely difficult situation. That is, uh, the rule of law, as you're talking about, it comes in only at the second stage. And it will, I think, work to moderate to some degree some of the dangers of collectivism, progressivism, socialism, whatever. But if you really think that you're going to stop this kind of problem uh, right. by having substantive agnosticism, yeah. like, for example, on how you organize the frequencies, um, and, and solve that by having procedural hearings. You just have to look at the history of comparable hearings in the United States and anywhere else where they do it, and it doesn't work. When Ronald Coase came to the United States, you know, what, you remember what the last work he did in England was on? It was on the public choice dynamics and the true dangers of just having a single BBC, <laughs> right? Um, monopoly power. And of course, when I was in England as a student, I got there in 1964, and there were some pirate radio stations giving you alternative voice. And you know what they did to those stations. Do you remember or not? I do not they know. bombed them. They occupied them. They put them out of business, right? right? God forbid that people should hear anything that doesn't come through that. And right. so if you want to imagine in the United States, just assume that the only radio station on the air was NPR. Yeah. Um, God help us. I mean, you listen to that station, it's a propaganda mill um, because they don't have other views. Now, I, I, we have, I've noticed that people are slowly trickling away, which I think is perfectly valid. Um, uh, but it's, I am going to have to leave at 1.30 anyhow because I have to prepare to teach a class at 2.30. Okay. Um, um, but is there, if there's one last question, I will take that. If there's not, I will thank you all for listening. Is there another question? One last question, anyone? Kitchy, kitchy, coo. <laughs> All right. Well, look, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Mark, for hosting me. Yeah. And we will renew our Roman law class again. Next yes. Okay. Thank you to everyone for coming.